Welcome everybody. I'm here with my good friend and bespoke tailor Sebastian Hofs. You might know Sebastian from the book we wrote together, um, Sewing Vintage Menswear. This is the German hard copy. Um, as you're seeing this video, the English version as an ebook should be available. Link in the video description. And we will sew today um, a club collar, a detachable club collar, something you've asked me for quite a while. So stay tuned. Okay, so a part of the book is a whole chapter about different color types and um, you can also, instead of buying the whole book, just um, buy the chapter about the colors um, and the chapter as well as the book include patterns for all the color types and well, just, let's just start with uh, the pattern. So for the collar we need, of course, enough outer fabric. We need one upper collar, one lower collar, upper collar stand, lower collar stand. We need two different types of interfacing and there is also the crux, because many of you ask what kind of interfacing to use. And the thing is, we can't really say it in general. Unfortunately, for hobby tailors, there are few interfacings that are really good, that still look good after washing. There are some in the industry, which we as hobby tailors unfortunately cannot buy. But maybe there's a solution in your country, some special store. Please share your experiences in the comment section. Anyway, you need thin interfacing, really, really thin, which is used as a foundation. It's ironed on, glued. And then on the upper collar comes a somewhat firmer interfacing, resembling just the pattern of the collar, because it must not be included in the seam allowances, except the side facing the collar stand. However, there are also really firm interfacings. So this one is really, really firm, like thick paper or cardboard. And this would be great for a vintage collar, but also quite uncomfortable. And if you want to have something like that, it's usually available even for hobby tailors. I cut out very big pieces, and this is of course quite wasteful, but it's easier to showcase what we're doing. I will now start with the thin interfacing, which is now steamed. It is important that the fabric is first either washed or intensively steamed, so it doesn't shrink when you wash the collar afterwards. So we basically shrink it before sewing, and therefore we do not iron the interfacing onto the fabric now. We first steam the interfacing without touching it, and give it some time to shrink, so it doesn't shrink in the laundry afterwards. If you don't shrink it beforehand, it might also develop bubbles or lumps. We don't want that. I'm now marking the seam allowance of one centimeter. You can choose any, it doesn't really matter because in the end everything gets cut back. 
Here at the bottom, I already added seam allowance to the interfacing, so we don't want to add more allowance here. Feature. Another interesting thing with the triangle ruler, I often see people that use it like this. Mark the seam allowance like this and then connect the dots. But you have all the lines included in the triangle. You can do a simple parallel shift, wonderfully easy like this, and you're much faster, including the curves that just consist of several shorter strokes like this. So now we have our upper collar and this is the under collar. In this case, the under collar doesn't get the thick interfacing because it will be on the outside later. The collar looks like this and on the inside where my hands are now will be the under collar. Now if you think a little, it's quite logical that the under collar is a little shorter considering the distances all around. And therefore we have to cut back the under collar just a few millimeters. You could exactly calculate it but I don't do that. Maybe other tailors do it. I simply cut back the few millimeters on the outer edge, but I stop at the curve. Pointy collars are of course even easier because then you can simply cut to the point. We will work in the remaining extra width that the upper collar needs later on. I also mark the centers of each collar piece by just cutting off tiny clips like this. There is nothing worse than a collar that is asymmetrical. You see it immediately. The same here, edge to edge, corner to corner, small clip. And up here, of course, too. And then I can adjust the pieces according to my center clips. We are sewing from this side. Another important note, I always see people sticking their needles in somewhere. They must be stuck where you will sew later. Some people stick it in somewhere like this and then wonder why everything is shifted afterwards. But really take the needles and stick them in here where you intend to put the seam. Important is now we have one centimeter of seam allowance. But if we now sew in exactly one centimeter, then we would be extremely close to this edge of the interfacing here, or directly at the interfacing. That would make turning later considerably more difficult. And therefore, we should add another millimeter of allowance so that the fabric is, has still room to get around the interfacing. That means I adjust the needle of my sewing machine now. You can do that on almost every machine. With modern sewing machines, you can adjust it even more precisely than on this old hack. With electronic machines, you can even adjust it right down to the fraction of a millimeter. Anyway, now I can sew along the foot of the sewing machine and automatically have enough distance to the interfacing. So now after sewing we will cut back the seam allowance. Nowadays it is common that when the collar will be top stitched later on the other side that you have a distance between seam and edge of approximately 0.5 cm, which means the seam allowance must be within these 5 mm. So it is nicely encased by the top stitching and that the seam allowance is protected.
it's brilliantly durable for washing this, uh, this way and so on. But earlier, when you really want a vintage collar, you need to cut it down to a millimeter because the top stitching was almost at the edge. And then you should also use tiny stitches with the machine because when we cut back all the seam allowance and then turn it, the fabric could easily fray when you used a coarse stitch. Perhaps you've always wondered what this ironing anvil is used for. You use it to press the particularly tricky seam allowances. So you can use the anvil to press the seam allowance here. However, our seam allowance is very short and fragile. So it makes little sense to use the anvil. Well, you can use it, but the fabric is prone to fray then, because it takes a lot of strain on the anvil, which is not good for such a linen fabric. So we do that differently. I'm loosely turning the collar now and then I will press the seam allowance in the direction of the under collar. So it wraps around the interfacing nicely. And we will do that on the sleeve board. It's important to press it in this direction, not the other way around. That wouldn't be good. Opinions differ on the next step. Many say that the collar is not to be ironed with piping. Piping means that the seam is a little bit moved to the back, which I prefer, because you can't see the seam from the outside. But there are also people who say that the seam has to lie exactly on the edge. But you can do that as you like. It may happen that you can get a glimpse of the seam from the outside. And I think it's prettier when the seam is on the inside, but that's just a matter of taste. I'm now ironing this from the right side, so that the seam is slightly behind the edge. Now here at the sewing foot, I found a spot to align the fabric with. You have to try that with your machine. It's different depending on your sewing machine. So I aligned the edge with the sewing foot and then I set the needle right where I want the seam to be, one millimeter from the edge. It requires a bit of practice to get it right and precise. If I wouldn't get it right, I would totally restart the seam here because it's important this becomes a beautiful top stitch seam. And at the beginning, the machine can transport the material rather badly. So I hold on to the threads and pull along. So the sewing machine transports evenly and the machine gets more fabric to grab and transport it further. As I said, the collar will sit at the neck like this. And now you can see already that here inside the under collar has still a little too much length, not from side to side, but from top to bottom. That means that we have to look at this and stroke it out. We do that by simply folding the edge here and we put some pins in and then you can either sew it once with a coarse stitch or we simply cut it off now and leave the needles in place for this. So we have our pattern piece here and we have these small marks on the pattern. They mark where the collar starts and stops on the collar stand. It's very important for the later fit to follow these marks. Otherwise, you won't get exactly the collar size you are aiming for, as well as making a perfectly symmetrical collar. And as I said before, 
If the color is asymmetrical, you can see that right away and it looks very odd. Therefore, I mark this here. Also, the lower collar stand needs to be cut a little shorter than the upper collar stand, just like with the collar. That means I do that now as well. I'm aligning everything now with these little clips we did before. So I know where my center is and I put the collar right side on right side onto the collar stand. This is the side with the interfacing, the reinforced side. And on this reinforced side of the collar stand lies the reinforced side of the collar. It's also logical that if you pin it together like this, you think it doesn't really fit because these curves are completely different. But it's just because of the seam allowances, they make it look odd. But one centimeter below the actual edge of the fabric is where you will sew and here the curves perfectly match. So this is also the line where you need to put the pins in. If you feel safe, you can sew everything together now right away, but I like to do it step by step. So first I do a supporting seam before, so I can pull out all the pins and it feels safer to do it like this. That means I just sew here now, once along with a very coarse stitch. As with the collar, I now also cut back the seam allowance very close to the seam. As I said with modern collars, and I mean perhaps among you are also people who now just want to sew a modern shirt collar, and at a sh modern shirt collar I would leave a 0.4 cm of seam allowance, but here we have to cut back a lot. Except here where the seam allowance starts and ends at the collar stand. Here I leave the complete seam allowance. It makes turning and a neat fold at the end much easier. So we leave the seam allowance here and start cutting a bit back. Now I will press the seam allowance around the interfacing again into the collar stand. I'll leave it open here and press the seam allowance into the collar stand. Later on, you can fold it neatly like this. So you should not leave the workpiece lying flat either, because you see it has different curves. If I pressed it this way, it would flatten everything out, which would not be good. That's why I usually just lay half of it on the board for pressing. Now we have this open edge here uh, and it is super easy to simply iron the rest of our seam allowance around this edge. That's what this interfacing is for and which serves like a predetermined breaking point. It means you can simply iron along this edge here. That's geht wirklich super easy. We left the seam allowance longer here. And now this seam allowance must be folded back into the lower collar stand. This will all be folded around the edge of the interfacing here. Then inside the workpiece and finally you get a clean edge. Now comes the last top stitching seam. 
No, it's the second last seam. It runs completely around the front. And at these corners here, the sewing machine has difficulties to transport the fabric again. So we do not start at an edge, but somewhere in between. Locking up would otherwise be difficult too. Find a position where to start the seam. Now the collar lies right here in between and I will add another top stitching seam here. You see that on commercial shirts very often. Here again the second top stitch seam exactly, where the seam allowances of the collar end to make the whole thing a little bit more stable and the collar will sit a lot better when done like this. And then we are almost done. Now we have our buttonholes marked here on the collar. The buttonholes on the pattern are a bit lower. We recommend looking at the collar stand of the shirt you want to use the collar with and transfer the distance to your collar. In case you are making the shirt from our book, then the marks align perfectly with the marks of the collars. But if you redesign a used shirt, for example, then look exactly on which height the buttonholes on the shirt um, are and which must of course be identical to the position of the buttonholes of the collar. So they are now drawn in here. I made a hole in the front and the back so I can just push the pen through here. If you have a buttonhole machine or a sewing machine with a buttonhole automatic, then of course you don't need a center line here, etc. Then you just do it right away or how your machine does it. But we are old school, so we need all the marks, start, end, and the middle. The machine can now only make the borders of the buttonhole. We will add the bars by hand later. After I've neatly stitched the buttonholes, I add the bars by hand and then our shirt collar is finally finished. Yeah, well, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope, or we hope, this video helped a bit with um, the topic of detachable collars. Um, don't forget to buy our book or at least the collar chapter. Uh, it would be a huge support. Um, thanks for watching. Subscribe, comment, like, uh, share this with all your detachable collar friends, and um, see you soon.